So how do our smartphones take such good photos today? And that's because they leverage something called computational photography. And in today's late night thoughts, that will be the topic, computational photography and how does it affect us. I'm Richard and welcome to Sepi Productions. So what is computational photography? It's the means of processing or capturing images through digital processing means rather than optical means itself. It sounds really, really weird and uh, to a certain extent confusing. But we have been doing computational photography for a long time. Things like noise reduction, things like panorama stitching, things like image stacking to get HDR, things like image averaging to reduce noise or remove certain artifacts, or even things like uh, depth of field focus stacking. All these have been done for a long period of time. It's just that modern handphones take it one step further, such as simulator bokeh through the means of either artificial intelligence, computer vision processing, or some sort of depth mapping merging with the main sensor itself, or taking multiple photos with multiple cameras. The thing is, computational photography has been here for some time. It's just that handphones have way better capabilities to achieve it. It's not that big cameras like this can't, but there are issues to doing it. So today's video really will talk about why handphones can do it, and what's the future of cameras like this. And why is it so important to actually embrace computational photography itself? In fact, let me talk about why computational photography is so important. You see, in a handphone, there's only this much size and this, this much space. You can't really put bigger optics, bigger sensor, easily in the handphone itself. But the thing is, if you just scale it up, same for our cameras, there's only just that much size and that much space. And the optics themselves can only be that big. You can't make lenses that are infinitely bigger. And there is the cost factor too. You can't just create something that costs a million dollars because nobody will purchase it. So as such, you know, computational photography is important for the purpose of capturing, enhancing, or making better images without the need of such a big physical increment or improvement themselves. Computational photography only requires software, requires processing, which today, is a lot better. Case in point, our handphones today have probably more processing powers than computers of five years ago. We probably can beat an i5 or even an i7 computer from five years ago with our iPhone 13 or our Samsung Galaxy 22. That is that much power, you know. And don't forget, you are probably editing your photos with Lightroom or Photoshop on that i5 or i7 computer. And now your smartphone can do it and even more. So really, processing power has been improving through the many years. And same goes for smartphone and also on high-end cameras today. We can take more shots, we can take faster shots, we can take 4K, 8K, 12K videos on our handphones or even on our cameras themselves. Processing power has been improving. The only difference is that the handphone processing power is more generic in nature where easily developers can write code for it and put it on a smartphone, be it developers such as Apple or Samsung, or developers such as third-party people that makes things like Snapchat or Lightroom, like Adobe himself. A generic processor just have that advantage. Unlike processors on cameras themselves, they are unique. They are meant to be speedy and real-time. However, they are not that easy to process stuff on. You probably have to write very custom codes to put it on the camera themselves. As such, it requires some time, some effort, and probably some lag time before technologies and software from the smartphone can migrate onto the camera themselves. And also, camera processors just don't improve that quickly. Uh, the iPhone changes a processor every year. A camera-wise, it takes three to four years before a new processor is 
you know, created himself. Such as a Digix 10. Digix 10 has been in the market for almost two years now. But the one before that was in the market for like three years. So yeah, processors on your camera is improving a lot slower, but every change is twice the power. While for iPhones, every change every year is only 20-30% difference. It's about the same if you look at the larger for picture itself. As such, our cameras today are very powerful. They just need the right software, which our handphone can easily develop, but not so much for cameras like this. That is one limitation why computation photography is not that um, common on cameras like this because manufacturers are still solving other things. The next thing is the readout speed of the sensor themselves. Now, what is readout speed? You know, if your sensor have a slow readout speed, you no, know, it's easier to explain that. What you have is tilted lines and weird as distortions, and they call it rolling shutter. Camera sensors that are smaller, they have less megapixels such as the one on the handphones, normally can read out a lot quicker. As such, a press of a button on the iPhone is usually not one photo, but a bunch of photos that comes out together, and then you can do computation photography for them. As I said, computation photography, a lot of them are revolving around combining multiple images and their information together to get a better photo. And readout speed really matters in such cases because if you have a slow readout speed, you have more artifacts, more issues, and then you can't really shoot that fast, right? But that said, modern cameras have caught up. Stack sensors such as the one in Z9 has foregone mechanical shutter totally, and it has a readout speed of 1 to 150. While cameras like the R3 and A1 still have a mechanical shutter, but they are optional. You can probably shoot the A1 or the R3 permanently on electronic shutter and the penalty is very minimal. So as such, the advantage of the sensor with its high readout speed so that you can take multiple shots in quick succession is now also available on high-end cameras like this. So it's really just a matter of software. However, stack sensors are expensive, as such you don't find them in cheaper cameras. One day, it will be cheap enough that it will go to all cameras out there. I do not know when, but it will be one day, and those cameras probably can achieve similar capabilities as our high-end ones. So, pretty much, what's really left is the software part of things and the processing part of things that have yet to happen in good scale on high-end cameras. They have already happened to a certain extent. We have high-res uh, image stitching that is already available on a lot of these cameras. And some cameras also have focus stacking built in, or some cameras have HDR built in. It's just that, of course, we don't do it as good as our smartphones. So we don't really normally classify them as the same thing, but they are by and large the same thing itself. And case in point is Olympus did a great job. They have handheld high-res, allowing you to combine multiple images while handheld. They have live NDs, which can simulate ND functions without the need of an ND, an extra optical element. They have HDR built-in, focus stacking built-in, a lot of other computation photography. I think they also have a night mode to allow you to shoot with the stars and everything without much issues. I think computation photography is coming, and it's really, really coming quickly. Because really, look at the Z9. This is a full-frame camera, and this is the size. I don't think you want to hold a camera any more bigger and I don't think the mount will change anytime soon. You can't put a bigger sensor there. You can't get more megapixels that easily. However, with computational photography, you can get more megapixels quickly. You can also get better dynamic range without changing the sensor themselves. And you can overcome certain limitations of optical or sensor things with computational photography itself. And let's not forget, what is the latest trend in IT or any form of computing? And that is artificial intelligence. Look at what Adobe high-res capability does. It increases your resolution, increases your details, but where do they get the details from? It's through artificial intelligence. AI, by the way, is a very big subject. We always use AI for almost everything, but when we actually see real-world applications such as this, it can be quite interesting. Another one is such as Topaz Denoise, allowing to denoise the photo, yet retain or even get better details than the original photo themselves. How did that happen, right? It's a form of artificial intelligence. And handphones will probably embrace it really, really soon. I can imagine the same thing will happen on such cameras because it's already happening on the autofocus system. Subject detection is a form of computational technique. <laughs> and it's already available on almost any flagship. Even Olympus is doing it now. So it's just a matter of time. 
a matter of time. Computational photography will be on these cameras, especially with the modern sensor, modern processors. It will happen definitely one day. When? I'm not too sure. Three years? Five years? Now that we have overcome autofocus in most of our system, Nikon has caught up. Olympus, based on its latest demonstration, has caught up. Now it's probably already left Fujifilm yeah, and Panasonic. That is yet to catch up. So once these two makers catch up, autofocus is pretty much a done deal. You can close your eyes, take a photo, and it still be sharp. And the next bound will be on image quality. And I don't think there's any faster, quicker, and better way to improve image quality other than to use some form of computational photography to enhance your photos. And with the stack sensor capability, the newer processor, you can take multiple shots in a single click without even knowing it. We will probably reach one day, maybe in five years' time or 10 years' time, where the photos no longer will be 14-bit. They will be 16-bit, 18-bit, maybe 20 bits even. You have a photo that probably can recover 10 stops of shadow, 5 stops of highlight, have 200 megapixels. And this will not be done through lenses. This will not be done through 200 megapixel sensors. This may all be done through some form of computational techniques. Maybe one day, megapixel will just be another number because we can achieve it by just combining more images together in very quick succession because we can do it. Our sensors are fast. And it will get faster. And really, that's about it for today. Computational photography is a big deal in photography. A lot of us don't know, but a lot of us are already doing it. One day, it will come built into our cameras and we will have the next generation of high-end photography equipment. And that's about it for today. I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.